Welcome to our first Driven by Purpose in 2021. I'm Brian Reber, head of the Department of Advertising and Public Relations at the University of Georgia. Our department began this series last semester to mark the important and novel ways businesses and individuals engage with employees, consumers, and other stakeholders. It's been a well-received series, so we plan to continue it this spring semester and beyond. Today, businesses are expected to contribute to society not only through providing a valuable product or service, but also improving the world in some way through organization, mission-driven purpose. We share another example of that with you today. I'm happy to introduce my colleague, Dr. Mike Cacciatore, who will introduce our guest. Thank you, Brian. Let me start by echoing Brian's words by welcoming everyone to this latest iteration of Driven by Purpose. My name is Michael Cacciatore, and I'm an associate professor here in the Department of Advertising and Public Relations at the University of Georgia. I'm honored to be here today introducing our two speakers, Melissa Libby and Jen Sloan. I could easily take the first 20 or so minutes of this video, <laughs> career achievements, but I suspect people are more interested in hearing directly from our speakers so I'll just pick out some of the highlights as I see them. If the name Melissa Libby sounds familiar to you, I'm not surprised. She's a published author and has been recognized as one of Atlanta's rising stars. She founded Melissa Libby and Associates in 1992, and since that time has opened more than 500 restaurants and served hospitality and retail clients throughout all phases of public relations. Melissa exemplifies the theme of our overall discussion, that of being driven by purpose. She's active in community issues, serves on several different boards, including the board of trust for our own Grady College. Thank you very much, Melissa. And she's been recognized as the Crohn's and Colitis Citizen of the Year. She's also a member of several food-focused nonprofits, including the James Beard Foundation and the National Restaurant Association. Unsurprisingly to anyone who knows me, those food-related positions are precisely where I wanna focus the rest of my comments. Melissa has described her job as eating and drinking for a living, which sounds just about perfect to me. She's published two cookbooks featuring Atlanta chefs, Atlanta cooks, and Atlanta cooks at home. And she's done something that I can say with absolute certainty that none of us have ever done. She took Julia Child through a McDonald's drive through Very impressive. Finally, while this might speak a little bit more narrowly to my interests more than the average audience member, She's a certified barbecue judge for the Kansas City Barbecue Society. I'm not sure if that fact will organically come up during the conversation today, but I have a number of different questions about that position that I'll be asking Melissa offline. <laughs> Alongside Melissa today, just as I understand she was when the two were students at the University of Georgia, is Jen Sloan. Jen has extensive experience across all aspects of government communications, media and public relations, and internal and external affairs. She has over 20 years experience working with some of Canada's leading government and political figures, including as the head of political and economic relations and public affairs at the Consulate General of Canada in New York City. Outside of government work, Jen has held positions as the Director of Government Affairs at Target Canada, as the inaugural Vice President of University Relations at York University, and as the Executive President of Corporate Affairs for nickel mining giant Vail. Currently, Jen is the Vice President of Public Policy at MasterCard, where she develops and manages MasterCard's public affairs and government relations programs in Canada. For the record, I've asked, and no, she can't help any of us with our credit problems. Like Melissa, Jen's work is a perfect fit for our Driven by, Pur for our Driven by Purpose speaker series. In 2019, she was awarded a MasterCard CEO Force for Good Award, which recognizes community volunteerism, Beyond that, she continues to give her time to groups like the Grady College Board of Trust, again, thank you very much, and a host of other boards and leadership, leadership positions. Too many to list here. But even with all these wonderful achievements, it's worth noting that Jen is a fan of the lowly Ottawa Senators hockey team. Nobody's perfect, I guess. Mm. Or before I turn things over to our two incredibly accomplished speakers, we want to begin this conversation with a short video produced by MasterCard. The video should set the tone for the remainder of this Driven by Purpose event. Enjoy the video, and thanks for joining us today. When you express the essence, the core, the purpose of your brand in just five words, 
You choose each word very carefully. Here is why we chose this one. Everyone is quite simply the most inclusive word in our language, a word that demands diversity. At MasterCard, we believe that diversity and inclusion are not only forces for good, but for innovation and growth. And so we create products and platforms that recognize those whose true identity too often goes unseen, that hear the music in those who might otherwise go unheard, that help female entrepreneurs compete and challenge businesses rise, that improve the lives of workers in the gig economy and leverage technology in order to level the playing field for all. Diversity and inclusion are not some long-term goals at MasterCard. They're who we are and how we see the world. They bind us to causes like racial justice, which is why we've pledged $500 million to tackle the hurdles to prosperity facing black communities. They bind us to values like basic fairness, which is why we've committed to bringing 1 billion unbanked people worldwide into the digital economy. The word everyone means everything at MasterCard. Because when we create ideas and innovations that remove barriers, promote understanding, and connect, yes, everyone to priceless possibilities, we not only drive our business forward, we help drive our world forward. Awesome video. Um, thanks for sharing that with us. And thank you, Mike, for the great bio. We'll definitely talk barbecue after. Um, it's uh, Melissa, I don't want to interrupt, but Professor Catch, as I call him, cannot get away with that type of comments. He and I are both Canadian and he knows better. My Ottawa senators are awesome. Just wait. We've been rebuilding for the last couple of years, but this year we're going to do it. <laughs> A, a perfect example of PR spin there. Perfect. That, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> took, took over already. <laughs> and it's been like this from the 80s. I'm here to tell you. Um, well, it is my great pleasure to um, interview today my, um, my good friend and fellow Grady classmate, uh, Jen Sloan. Um, we do go way back and um, I'm just so excited that um, we have stayed such good friends for all this time. I knew when we were officers in PRSSA together that she was going to be a very, very successful um, person one day and she certainly has been. So I'm very proud of you, Jen. Um, so to talk about our topic today, I thought the best way to get started is with the big picture and then let's, let's drill down a little bit to the details. So if you could start out by telling us about MasterCard um, and MasterCard as a company and, and what you do and what you don't do, which I guess is uh, help people with their interest rates. Um, so please, um, please <laughs> let us know um, what the company is and, 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 and you know, who MasterCard is as a business. Um, that would be a great way to start. Yeah, Melissa, thank you. I'm absolutely thrilled here to be with you um, as well. Um, you know, this, this, um, our being students together in PRSSA, um, dare we share our trip to Denver for the PRSSA <laughs> National Convention um, with Maria. Um, there was a Green Bay Packers Denver game that Monday night. It was snowy. And if you think back to the ABC cast, then You'll, you'll know that there's a good story there, but one we're not going to share now. Um, so thank you for having me and, and uh, couldn't think of a better person to have this conversation with. And thank you for the question about MasterCard because, you know, and the reality is I can't help you with your interest rate. I can't help you with your credit limit because guess what? I don't issue the plastic. MasterCard doesn't issue the plastic. That's your bank. We're a B2B business, um, but we're the technology that allows that transaction between yourself and the merchant and your bank to go through in the blink of a, an eye. Um, and so that's a real big misconception. I can tell you uh, last year, well, no, not last year, right? Because we were all virtual. So it must have been two years ago. I was off on Parliament Hill in Ottawa, our nation's capital here in Canada. And a member of parliament was so excited to see me when I was in his office. And I said, well, I'm excited to see you too. And he goes, I can't believe this personal service. And I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled I can be here to tell you about MasterCard. And he said, yes, when you called me last week to say 
my card was compromised and not use it to think that you'd be hand delivering me to me today my new one i went oh my god you know we've got a complicated business and if he doesn't understand the fundamentals it's hard to have a conversation so mastercard is a technology company um, we operate in over 210 countries around the world and again we're that back end we're that communications that talks between the merchant um, and your card and your bank and trying to make that uh, that transaction and as I said I'll use that phrase again do it in the blink of an eye making sure it's secure and safe awesome thank you I, I actually learned a lot about that too I, I I didn't understand so I'm sure that a lot of people are are glad to get straight there so MasterCard and, and has I'm wearing orange today oh right? I, I I just I don't want anyone to think that I'm dressed in Tennessee colors or God forbid Clemson or anything it's orange for MasterCard just just so we're clear yes I'm really glad you cleared that up because I was worried I I've never known you to uh, go off the red and black before so <laughs> thank you makes sense now you're representing so that's good um, so MasterCard has a slogan doing well by doing good not a slogan a philosophy I should say um, can you tell us about that yeah it, it's absolutely ingrained in, in, in who we are um, and um, it is um, our, our North Star, as you can say, doing well by doing good. And what that means is, is that we're upholding our principles of, of, of decency, which is also at our core, um, and that guides our company. And, and we believe that if people and the planet um, are allowed to thrive, then so are we as a business. Um, and so we do give back, uh, we do uh, ensure that um, financial inclusion is, is a big theme in, in our social impact area. Um, and um, we just really believe in that. And it, it, it's interesting. A lot of folks think that you have to make a distinction that, that what you do out in your communities, you know, can't help your business or or it's not genuine and it's not authentic. And, and our, our, our CEO, actually, he just stepped away, uh, but he is uh, our executive chairman on, on the MasterCard board. Um, he's been very eloquent about this and, and very purposeful in his statements um, that, you know, it, if we as a company don't do well, we, we can't give back. So some of what we do underlying it, yes, uh, impacts us favorably commercially, um, but that doesn't make it um, um, not genuine or or not the right thing to do. Um, so that's kind of that's how it frames up for us. Um, and um, we've we've been very clear, very clear about that since the beginning. Um, and when everyone subscribes to it, and you work in a culture that everyone's driven by that it's uh it's awfully exciting and it and it makes it, it validates it, at least it validates for me that this is the place for me to be and for me to work mm -hmm. and i i really love that you know doing well because to your point it's it's not a you're not a nonprofit. you know you've you've got to you know report to to stakeholders and and to still make that doing good a core value of the company is is yeah. Awesome. yeah stakeholders and shareholders right and shareholders. Um, so yeah no absolutely absolutely um it's imperative yeah so it's, it's it's great um so tell us about your role at the company um based in toronto yeah so uh so i'm i'm a canadian who took my grady degree and 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 came back to to canada um, and um, I now find myself at MasterCard. I've been here for the last uh, five years. And, and it was interesting that we're, we're having this conversation because I remember when the search company called about this role um, after Target had come into Canada and sadly failed. Um, we miss our Target. Um, 
it, it was interesting. Um, the rural was right downtown and I could walk and, and everything was keyed up. And I liked the idea of working for a, a, a global big brand again. And I was okay with the multinational. Um, but the thing I probed on the most going through all the interviews was the culture of MasterCard. And, and I've already touched on that a little bit, um, but that was super important to me. Um, and so it didn't, I mean, the role was great. It, 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 I lead the public policy team here in Canada. So that's all of our interactions um, between, you know, municipal, provincial, um, federal governments. Um, I'm part of the North American public policy team. I have a, a great number of colleagues who are based in Washington, D.C., and I work with them closely. Um, but I'm also sitting on the Canadian business leadership team. So I'm part of the team um, that drives the MasterCard business in Canada um, throughout all of our entities um, and services. And um, that's what makes it exciting. And that's, that's new to me. Um, you know, the, the public policy is still gets me jazzed. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, think oh, if only we had had the public affairs communications, the PAC course when we were there, um, you know, the, the students are that are enrolled in that fabulous program, um, you know, kind of end up doing what I've done through my career. I like the public policy uh, elements, but learning about the business has been super exciting over the last uh, five years. But last year, no, it wasn't even last year. You know, COVID's just got me so confused <laughs> about this. Late in 2019, the president of MasterCard Canada had returned to Canada. She and I had been on the leadership team when I first joined. She then went out to run the Baltics and the Nordics and, and, and came back um, to Canada and is now leading uh, the Canadian team here. She came back and she said, you know, Jen, in Canada, in the Canadian business, we do a lot of great things uh, philanthropically, through charitable giving, through volunteerism, and it's fantastic. But I have heard from customers upon return, stakeholders, everybody wants us to contribute to their cause. And instinctively, she said, I know to say no, but I can't say no because we do this. And so would you take on the assignment of developing the social impact strategy for the Canadian business? And so I, uh, because I'm passionate about this kind of work, I believe in this kind of work. In my personal time, I, I do this kind of work um, involved in the community and volunteerism. I, I absolutely said, uh, I'd love to do it. Can't do it alone. Um, so I'm working with a, a social uh, impact working group, but that's how that started. And so, you know, there's almost three kind of pillars to the role I have now. And that's a very long winded answer of telling you what I'm doing in MasterCard Canada these days. No, that's great. That sounds like a very busy job and a very interesting job for sure. So um, you told me that social impact in Canada is different than social impact in the United States. Can you elaborate on that? Maybe give an example? Yeah, so so it, it's it's definitely somewhat different from from the Canada business to our U.S. business to the you know the business and and the other country uh, regions where we operate, um, and that's the beauty of our overarching you know doing good by doing well um, um, mantra because um, you can customize to the local market. Um, so what's consistent is that MasterCard gives every team member five days per year to do community service. So, um, and in fact, you know, from time to time, the, the leadership team is checked on whether we are actually taking those, the time and those days um, to give back. Um, so that, that's here in Canada. But when you think about some of the issues here in Canada in the areas of diversity and inclusion, they're, they're quite different than those to, you know, our cousins south of the border. 
Um, we are a country. We are not the 52nd state, <laughs> as some people like to say, and we have some clear differences. Uh, although we're very close and you're our closest neighbor and friend and we so value that. And they say in Canada, when, when, uh, when the uh, US sneezes, Canada catches a cold. That's how close <laughs> we are. Um, but there are some differences. So when you think of diversity and inclusion and you think about giving back or developing a social impact strategy, um, and you think of the populations or the marginalized communities that we might want to partner with or tap into. Um, for instance, the, the Black community does not come to mind, top of mind, in Canada. What comes top of mind is our Aboriginal community. And so when you think of the makeup of Canada, we, we are a country of immigrants. Um, and so we have a lot of immigrants here. Um, we are that mo perfect mosaic. Um, but when you think of marginalized communities, or if you think of the DNI space instinctively in Canada, you would think about our Aboriginal community. So that's one clear distinction that, that you know, when we think about what we need and want to do here in Canada, how it might be different from my colleagues in Washington or our corporate office in, in Purchase, New York, or, or our um, campus in St. Louis and so on. That makes sense. That it's very, that's very interesting to me. So um, I know that you've been re um, working remotely um, in 2020. What, what changes uh, came to the company and to you um, during COVID? How was the business affected? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, the business has been impacted um, in, in a couple of ways. I mean, you know, my heart goes out to um, small businesses. You know, 75% of the Canadian economy is built on small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, and so we have um, a lot fewer of those big companies like, like you do in the United States. And so um, I know kind of um, the internal um, tough decisions that we're making and, and you know, the, the revenue we're looking at and so on and seeing the drop. I can only imagine um, how small business is doing. And, and, and again, you know, I, I, I think of you and your business. Um, and, and there's a bit of a correlation there because, you know, what MasterCard also has is, is we have data. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's um, not data on individuals, again, because um, we don't issue the cards. We can see a basket size. We can't tell you what's in the basket. We can only see a basket size, a dollar amount, what time it was purchased and the merchant it was purchased and from where the card comes, Canada, Germany, the United States or whatever. Um, but it's definitely down in the T and E side, um, and you know I think of you and, and your business, um, and and airlines. I mean, how many people uh, purchase an airline ticket um, in cash, right, or necessarily debit online? Which, in fact, we don't have debit online in Canada. So so we're seeing that decline, but we're also seeing the increase of e-commerce. E-commerce, and thank goodness. Um, we have credit cards because it does allow businesses to continue on. It eliminates, you know, the cash to some degree, which some people are nervous on, on, on just the germs and, and so on. Um, we have phenomenal contactless here in Canada. So just the tap, tapping of the cards. Um, so, but we wanted to increase that limit so that again, there didn't have to be that exchange um at at certain merchants so been a heck of a lot of change our team members have been resilient um, it's just been incredible their ability to shift um, from an in-office environment to a virtual environment um, but you know not without its challenges you know we have a lot of folks that that have customers and that's you know there's no better way to service a customer Melissa you you know best you know face to face um, you know it's very hard for me 
um, in the early days, it is getting better, but to have conversations with members of parliament or senators or you know, government officials because they didn't have the technology ready on their end for Zoom conversations or whatever. One Department of Finance official at one point said, you know, can we get on the line after 7 p.m. because that's when I'm allowed to log on to reduce the congestion on the airwaves. So lots of changes, um, but actually it's really helped inform that social impact strategy work we're doing because now more than other um, any other time, I think we've really seen the vulnerabilities in our communities um, here and, and the need is great. Um, so in, in that way, um, it's, been, it's been helpful that it's so clear to us where the need is. Mm -hmm. And how long have you, um, have you had that purpose driven? How long has MasterCard been a purpose driven company this way? I, I looked on your website and saw the gender equity, the, the true name program for the LGBTQ yeah. community, the parental leave, uh, you know, just all of the great programs that you have that I'm sure absolutely have come to the forefront here recently. How long has that been going on? You know what, since day one. And I can say when? that, I, I, I can say that since day one, because if you look back to when MasterCard IPO'd, um, on that day, there was a commitment that 10% of the, of the offering of the IPO that day would go to a foundation, huh. right? And so there is the MasterCard Foundation. And so just from that initial day of offering, um, they are one of the most, um, what, what, what's a good word to use, endowed, um, well-off foundations uh, in the world. Now, they happen to operate out of Canada. That's coincidental because when you, when you know the background and, and you know, MasterCard and our competitors, we used to be not-for-profits until we went public. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we did go public, it, it put some entities together. And so the, the uh, European banker said, don't uh, have the foundation in the US. And the American banker said, don't have the foundation in Europe. So they went Switzerland and put it here in Toronto. Um, but there is a very big Chinese wall between us. So they do phenomenal things in, in Africa. Um, they are now finally, because of the pressure of, of being housed and, and anchored in, in Toronto, in Canada, um, to do things uh, here domestically. So they're doing phenomenal ed education programs with the Aboriginal communities. But I can tell you, point to that and since day one, um, and definitely under the last uh, 10 plus years under Ajay Benga, um, he lives and breathes um, giving back um, all with the, with the decency quotient of our team members. As he said, he puts a hand behind your back and he expects us to put a hand behind our teammates' backs to push us forward. I love it. I love it. That's well put. That's awesome. Um, is there anything else you would like to tell us about MasterCard or about how um, your personal drive um, for to, to make a difference in the world led you there or is just a part of your life? Yeah, well, you know, Melissa, it's interesting. I don't know about you, but, but you know, when I graduated, the, one of the great things the University of Georgia did, but in turn, Grady, what was kept in touch or they, they kept in touch with me and, and they, you know, they didn't let me go. And I remember they said, you know, even if you can give, this goes back to how old we are, even if we could give $5 <laughs> the year after we graduated. And so I almost, if I think about it, I can almost credit, you know, UGA and Grady for starting my, my giving back. I just had the most phenomenal four years um, at UGA, um, you know, for, for many reasons, having classmates like yourself, you know, the, the professors at Grady, the, the campus, you know, the whole uh, living in the, in the South, coming from a Northern Ontario mining town, which Professor Ketch can, 
can uh, visualize in his head. Um, and so that, you know, them saying, can you just give five bucks back? Um, I think it started there and it's just continued. Um, but, you know, what a waste, um, you know, to do all these. And, and two, I'll tell you what else. You know, when I was in government and when I was the director of communications for the deputy prime minister, and before that he was a minister of foreign affairs and I was his decom then as well. I mean, really was fortunate and honored to, to travel the world. Um, and, and you get to see how, fortunately, how fortunate we are here um, in North America. And yet we should not be naive um, to the underlying societal problems that need fixing and people need a hand up. Um, and so um, I just, um, I take that uh, personally and I take that seriously and, and I'm just committed to it. I mean, how about you? you? You you have a phenomenal track record of giving back and working in the community. And I know that 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 just doesn't stem from a business imperative. It's, it, it's who you are, it's in your core as well. Um, absolutely, I, I, I agree with you. I feel like, you know, my parents instilled that in me, but until you're, you know, in college and really thinking about your, whole, your life, you know, making decisions for yourself, that's when you really solidify what your purpose is and what you want to do with your life. And at Grady, I was always inspired to be my best, to do, to do the right thing, to help others. You know, public relations was really, that's why I think I was, I was drawn to it because that's a lot of that is helping others, you know, in one way or another. And so um, I, I definitely credit Grady as well for just really um, putting me on the path and, and, and putting the hand behind me and, and pushing me forward like, like your guy. Yeah. And, and, you know, Jody Daneman, who's our, the, our chair of the board of trusts now, uh, you know, he's, he's had a, a, a phrase he's used for years, and, and I know it's not unique to him. I, I, I know it comes in the roots of, of, you know, spiritual service or whatever, but time and treasure, right? So, so, so giving back, and as I said, MasterCard has those five days and, and you log them and, and that's fantastic. Um, but also too on, on the monetary side, I mean, MasterCard has a matching program up to 15,000 US dollars a year. Now in Canadian dollars, that's a gazillion dollars <laughs> given our exchange rate. But, but again, it's, it's putting the money, you know, where, 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 their, where their mouth is, uh, if that's the right coin of phrase. Um, but, you know, and even on, on Giving Tuesdays, which is usually in the beginning of December, MasterCard, you know, um, in the past has said, not only will we match one-to-one -one today, if you choose to match, because it's up to the team member, we'll, we'll match you two for one today. Um, so, so again, it, it's not just episodic at MasterCard, it really is ingrained in the fabric and woven into the fabric of who we are each and every day, so. Well, thank you so much. It was um, really, really interesting learning about your job. I know that everyone enjoyed that. And I know that we have um, a few questions that um, are from the students that Mike is going to uh, read out and um, address to Jen, I assume. Oh, no, come on, Melissa. <laughs> Some of these are for you as well. Yeah, I, I think the questions can go both ways. Um, yes, we were supposed to have a student here come in, read the questions. Unfortunately, she could not make it. And so I think the thinking was, we'll take the professor that looks like he's 17 years old and have him do it. So, so here I am to ask a few questions. It's the good Canadian water, Mike. <laughs> exactly. Um, the first question I'll ask is, and I think it can go to, to um, both Melissa and Jen, how do you define success and how has that definition changed as you've progressed in your career? Go ahead, Melissa. Okay, I'll go, I'll go first. Um, you know, that's a really great question and, and no, no doubt it has changed a great deal over time. I think that um, the younger you are, and maybe it doesn't have anything to do with age, but for me, I was just very short term um, focused on my success. It was, you know, got to get a job, got to get promoted, got to buy a house, got to, you know, like you just kind of were just like every couple of years um, sort of. And now that you really kind of feel like you've 
you know, accomplish some things, you, you know, some of those things, some of those goals that you, that you really wanted to accomplish, you, you want to do more. You want to be more significant. You want to help people. You want to mentor people. I, thought, I, I used to always be like, oh, I'm, I'm so busy. I don't know if I can be a mentor. And now I, I say to people, can I be your mentor? Do you, do you need a mentor? You know, they're probably like, get away from me, lady. Um, but I just really find this huge desire now to help others. And I think it just comes from just, you know, getting out of the rat race just a little bit enough to calm down and say, wow, I think I can maybe help help someone. So that is by far my definition of success now is if somebody comes to me and says, thank you so much for that advice that you gave me, it really helped that that's, that's gold to me. So. Yeah, and I think for me, it, it, it's not very different. I mean, it definitely has evolved over the years. And, you know, even after last year, um, I think I've recalibrated and and thought a little bit more and you know it's a bit cheeky to say success is getting through a day or a week of COVID um, but um, you know success is for me almost is is um, you know being present being present in the moment um, and really taking in what's happening now and when you then collectively weave in those individual weeks and months then you've got a storyline. Um, and hopefully during that time, you've used your time wisely. Um, you haven't been um, so beholden to your, to your job and, and your computer and your telephone, for those of us who still use telephone to talk, not to text. Um, but, and, and you've complemented that with, with your, your family um, and then back out into your community. Um, I think the young people today um, amaze me. And I too, like Melissa, I love working with them. Um, I think their energy is infectious. I think they take me out of my comfort zone. Um, and the more I am um, stay out of my comfort zone, I know this is gonna sound a bit odd, but I think it puts me at my best. Um, and then again, um, as you conquer, as I said, these days, it become weeks, it become months then hopefully I'm, I'm rounding up that package to, uh, to live my best life. Excellent. They put me out of my comfort zone in classes all the time. I don't think I embrace it as much as you. <laughs> uh, a second question that I think can go to, to each of you. Um, what does the term social impact mean to you? And what advice do you have for companies and organizations that have yet to implement a social impact strategy? Yeah, Melissa, I'll take a stab at this one. First of all, I would find it um, staggering if companies haven't thought about it. Um, and, you know, Parker Middleton gave me this great book uh, called uh, by Alexandra Mars on giving. Uh, Purpose is the new currency. And in this book, he talks about, you know, it should be one of your interview questions if you're deciding what company to work for, because um, really I think the young people of today are, are looking for it. And I think if you as a company don't have it, um, then I don't think you're gonna attract the best talent. Um, and, and what is social impact? I mean, it, it's a collection of things, right? It's, it's your, it can be your charitable giving. It can be your um, volunteerism. It can be your uh, company fundraising on behalf of a cause. Um, for us, as, as you know, Melissa asked me to talk a little bit about what we're doing here for our social uh, impact strategy, we're taking that all together, right? Um, but we're but but here's what our team members are asking us to do in thinking about a social impact strategy is you, you got to be authentic right um, it's got to uh, put you uh, in touch with the communities to which you operate it's got to be local localization but it also has to be national in scope um, to have some um, some relevance um, but again it's that volunteerism it's the charitable giving, it's, it's the, you know, assisting with, with uh, not-for-profits and their fundraising. It's a combination of those things. Excellent. Anything to add to that, Melissa? I, 
I would just say um, social impact statement sounds very, you know, big and maybe a little corporate. And um, it could maybe scare some smaller companies off because, wow, it, we don't have a social impact statement. And then when you look at their, their, the good that they do, well, they do have one. It may be phrased differently. They may call it something else. It may just be in the owner's head, but uh, I work with a lot of small businesses, mostly restaurants. And for the you know 25 plus years that I've worked in that industry, they are the biggest hearted, most giving people that you've ever seen. And I love that. And I probably, if I, if I talked to all my clients and said, do you have a social impact statement? They probably, every one of them would say no. And yet they, they do, they really do. So I would just add that, you know, that's a phrase and that's a good phrase, but, you know, consider that it could um, be worded differently or, or be looked at differently. Good point. Yeah. Uh, this one's specific to Jen. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your involvement with Music Canada and what that organization means to you? Yeah, great question. Thank you for that. Um, I am the chair of Music Canada. Um, Music Canada is a trade advocacy or, uh, organization that advocates on behalf of the major record labels uh, in Canada. Um, and artists. Um, so if you think of Sony and Universal and, uh, Universal and Warner Music, um, that is the uh, group that we represent. I, um, I'm their first independent uh, chair person. Uh, and uh, in fact, myself and uh, my board colleague Farah are the first uh, two independent uh, chair, uh, as independent board members. Um, and again, talking about taking me out of my comfort zone, um, artists are creative, you know, music executives are creative and, and, you know, Jen Sloan's kind of black and white and, 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 you know, let's move forward like this. So, so it's been super exciting. Um, you know, if I, if you ever asked me what I wanted to be for a day, you know, most people who know me think it's probably, you know, prime minister, president, yada, yada. Uh -uh. I want to be a singer on a stage with a huge audience singing and people are enjoying it because as Melissa can attest, I have zero musical talent, zero, 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 but I love to sing with my pen as my microphone. <laughs> so it's a great opportunity. It, it, I'm a woman in a man's world and part of the reason, sorry, to, I should be serious. Part of the reason um, that I was asked um, is because of my experience on other boards in the governance area but Music Canada also made a commitment to diversity and inclusion, and they saw that, you know, they needed a woman's voice. Um, and so it was a, a bit of a, a perfect marriage at the right time, and um, it's a lot of fun. Excellent. I think we're just about out of time, but I'm actually going to sneak in one more question because I think the students would be upset if I didn't ask this one. Um, and that is, what is one piece of advice you can offer to students that'll be graduating and entering the job market in 2021? I'm gonna go first. Um, you know what? I, I hate this question. Where do you want to be in five years? I think, I think too many um, young people these days are overly programmed and they're overly programmed um, you know, in their career. Like if I'm not doing this in three months, if I'm not doing this in a year, if I haven't had three jobs in the first two years since I've graduated, I'm failing. I would say, hold on, relax, let it come. I mean, you've got to do the legwork without a doubt, but let it come, enjoy it. I think if you get so you know, with the blinders on and move forward, then, then you're, you just don't um, allow yourself to see other opportunities. And other opportunities could be lateral moves, they could be non-paying in the first instance, um, they could be something that you never thought, you know, you'd have to do with a university degree, but you'll learn something from it. So I would say don't overthink, don't over-programming, because you'll lose sight of some really um, neat opportunities that are probably waiting for you. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Anything to add, Melissa? Um, yeah, I would just 
I would say to emphasize your flexibility and your ability to pivot, um, because we really saw that everyone in the world saw that need in 2020. And when it came time to evaluate team members, those were the ones that were your, your heroes. And so now when I think about who am I going to add to my team, I know I need that characteristic. I, I need that skill. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to key in when somebody says that. Um, I would also encourage everyone that's graduating to, I know we always say this to like network, reach out, you know, certainly to anybody, uh, you know, that's a Grady grad. But I, I find myself, and again, you know, maybe my earlier statement about wanting to mentor people, but I, I take more time than I used to pre-2020. I will talk to them on the phone. I will meet them for a socially distanced coffee. I will do a Zoom. I will, I just feel a little bit more available and want to help. Maybe I feel for them too, because I know how hard it must be looking for a job right now, but people are still hiring. They absolutely are. And I would say, you know, don't accept that it's doomsday. Go out there. You're probably going to be surprised at um, how many people are willing to, to talk to you and, and that there are good jobs out there. Perfect, thank you so much. Thank you so much both um, Melissa and Jen and I'll, I'll throw the keys over to Brian and let him take us into the, the end of this. Thanks Mike and Melissa and, and uh, Jen. What a great story about MasterCard and MasterCard Canada. And I wanna say that we're, we, uh, we're really excited about the chemistry of this group two Grady friends from uh, years gone by and uh, two Canadians and it worked out just perfectly. <laughs> so thanks for that. To those of you who are watching, uh, thanks for being with us and, and do plan to join us for, and watch for our next uh, Driven by Purpose presentations. We're grateful for all the individuals who've been willing to share the insights of how organizations and individuals uh, purpose can drive business and nonprofit causes. Join us on February 18 for our next Driven by Purpose episode featuring Meredith Seacrest, Executive Director and COO of the Ryan Seacrest Foundation. Thank you and have a good day. <laughs>